Hello, it's Dr. Courtney, also the Courting Happiness Podcast. Have you checked out our happiness library? It's a carefully curated library with books that I highly recommend that are a must for your happiness library. Go to drcourtneyalston.com forward slash happiness library. That's D-R-K-O-R-T-N-I-A-L-S-T-O-N dot com forward slash happiness library. The authors you will hear on the podcast can also be found in our happiness library. You can also purchase their books on our site. On top of that, your purchase also helps this podcast and the mission of courting happiness. Let's spread happiness and the word. Check out books on the courting happiness library. It will not only change your life, but it can also help you with your next chapter too. Let's get back to the podcast. Welcome to the Courting Happiness Podcast. This is a space where self-care becomes part of your day. A space where you learn evidence-based strategies to help your life, share it with those you love, and cultivate well-being at work. I'm your host, Dr. Courtney Alston. I'm a former news director, television reporter turned happiness scholar, TEDx speaker, and transformational trainer. I also understand hardships. While working my dream job in television, I lived a nightmare suddenly becoming a young widow after 86 days of marriage. Marriage. I became committed to learning more about resilience, healing, and happiness. This is how I discovered my area of research, which is positive psychology. Now I'm living my calling of training individuals and organizations on happiness. And my new chapter begins with being happily engaged. The courting and courting happiness is about a true courtship. I like to say commitment with happiness. The K in courting stands for the vulnerability of sharing my story, inspirational interviews with phenomenal people, the Fusion of positive psychology and so much more. You'll learn how to commit to your well being one episode at a time. I hope you subscribe and share. So, are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to episode 41. We have a special guest who is a friend of mine from my career as a television reporter. Hector Contreras joins us today. We worked together in Midland, Texas more than 20 years ago, and I'm pretty excited because we had a mini reunion recording this podcast. Hector's story is truly transformational. The youngest of eight children, he suffered loss at an early age. At two years old, his father was murdered. At eight years old, his brother was stabbed to death. At 14, he lost another brother in a motorcycle accident. At school, he found himself bullied as a kid. Hector felt that he needed to dim his light to survive. That journey inspired his first children's book, Carlos Finds Courage, which focuses on battling bullying. He talks about the bravery in writing about suffering and the transformative work he did to face it. So I will tell you this. I am so super excited today. I am going to do my best to control all of my emotions <laughs> because I have such a special guest here. His name is Hector Contreras. He is an author. He is an incredible human being. He is a phenomenal person. And I say this because Hector and I met years ago, not too many years ago. <laughs> well, years ago, <laughs> actually, actually about 20 years ago, yeah, starting off yeah. our careers as broadcast journalists for a local station in Midland, Texas. And so I'm so excited to have him here on the podcast to talk about his book called Carlos Finds Courage. And guys, it is an amazing read. It's a children's book, but yeah. as far as I'm concerned, this is something for the, you know, the child in terms of it, at heart, but it's also yeah. great in terms of adults and, yeah. and learning great lessons along the way. So welcome, Carlos. I'm look, I mean, uh, look, I called you Carlos. <laughs> welcome, Hector. That's when you know you're too excited. I'm like, wait yeah. a minute. I've already called you your character. <laughs> it, it's, it, you're, you're partially on the right track. It's, it's, I had to switch the name just a little bit <laughs> for alliteration purposes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, did I just call Hector Carlos? Yeah, yeah. yeah he, is, he is a dear friend. And so that's why I'm so happy to have him here. Yeah. Let's talk about Carlos, even though I've already kind of did the Freudian yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, 
terms of that, let's talk about your incredible book. Yeah. So Carlos Finds Courage it shares his journey, really, yeah. as it relates to bullying. Yeah. How did this all come about? You know, I, I was inspired to write this book after um, after going to uh, Oregon last summer for a spiritual retreat. It was called Souls with Stamina at wow. the, the Rapid Eye Institute in Salem, Oregon. And I was at a place in my life, you know, we were in, 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 in the precipice of, of COVID, I was finding myself uh, locked up and sort of in the midst of changing careers again. I had just closed a Mexican food restaurant um, because I, that was just not going to be my cup of tea. It was, uh, it was more than I anticipated. But um, when, when I got to the Institute, one of the um, one of the facilitators told me, she's like, your light is so bright, but it doesn't match your personality. You've, you're sort of very meek and mild. You, you, you seem beaten up. And, and she says, I can help you overcome that, you know, if you're willing to do the work. And I'm like, listen, I came here with the intention of being broken wide open. Okay. I, I want to do the work to figure out whatever, emotional childhood emotional trauma I've got that's keeping me from feeling um, sort of at peace or um, a, a, a tranquil with my life that I, I'm, I'm willing to do the work. Um, and so uh, as as we started doing some of that work, and this is where it's going to sound a little woo woo, I, you know, again, I had, I've, I've done counseling, I've done therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had was on antidepressants and uh, anti anxiety, some sleep medication, just to help sort of calm my nerves about um, just life in general, right? And, and I just wasn't feeling that the, the pizzazz that I had for life was gone, even though chemically, I was sort of normal, but I wasn't myself. And so I thought the spiritual retreat may be a good balance to what I need um, on, on the upflip side of traditional therapy. And so before I knew it, you know, we're in this room, there is a Tibetan bowl therapy session, wow. you know, yes, yes, we're, we're, we go into I go into this trance, uh, after doing some deep breathing, and you know, you're, I, I close my eyes, and I'm just doing the breathing, I'm letting the bowls and just being being taken by the moment. And all of a sudden, like, I don't know how much time had gone by, but I come out of it and I had these visions while I was in this trance of, of, of my younger self. I saw, I saw myself like in this cabin in the woods and, and, and I, he was, I say he, but it was me because it was the weirdest thing. Like I told you, and I'm total. this is a totally sober event, right? But this is things that's <laughs> happening in my, in, in that I'm seeing. And, and I see myself in this little cabin and the door was locked and I couldn't get it open. And, and I remember having the conversation through the window with my younger self saying like, open the door, like come out and play. It's really fun out here. And, and I was, that little boy was scared. He was scared to come out. And so after that session, I come out and I talk about it with, with the facilitator. And what I was able to garner was that, that that was some trauma that had happened to me as a younger kid that I hadn't identified or wasn't able to put words to. So th the more I talked about it, I identified it as this particular moment in my life when I, my mother had taken me out of uh, Catholic school and taken me to public school. And all of a sudden I was new in town or the new kid in school. And I, I don't know why, I don't know why I was a target of being bullied. And all of a sudden I was just in that situation, but I didn't know, I couldn't identify it. And, and, and so it made sense at that time during that spiritual retreat when that facilitator told me, you've, you've learned to dim your light because of this situation. You've learned psychologically and behavioral wise to dim your light because somehow you learned as a child that that shining or, or being yourself was not OK, because at some point you were being bullied for being yourself. And I was like poof. Wow. It made sense. Yeah. It made sense. So, so that book came from that, that, that spiritual journey, Courtney, because I realized that even though 
I had no awareness that something so seemed so trivial could have such a long lasting impact on my life as an adult, right? This is, and you know, I can tell you that I think, thankfully have never had um, any issues with the law, but I have used alcohol and uh, in, in a very, very negative way. Like I was, I was self-medicating with alcohol um, and, and taking lots of risk behind a vehicle while I should not be driving. And I knew that was not right. So that was the work that I, that's what I say when I wanted to be broken open, that's what I wanted to heal. Cause I wanted to be uh, sort of more awake and aware of the things going on in my life. I love that you share being broken open. Yeah. You know, because one of the things I, I, <sighs> I really treasure it, being that my area of research is in positive psychology and uh, there's a great book focusing on post uh, traumatic success. Mm -hmm. And it talks about resilience and also the value of kind of some really the value of sometimes these broken pieces, right. but that also can kind of help uh, restore, then also it can help transform us, especially if we have a certain mindset in terms of how we see things. Mm -hmm. And what I love so much is that the whole statement in regards to being broken open, it speaks to this level of really being open to the process. And, and, and I'm so glad you, you noticed that because I, I say that genuinely, because when, when you're I was sort of at the end of my rope, right? I I was I was in my mid forties. I had I was I'm, I'm I was living in in Midland, uh, not Midland, in Kirksville, um, Kirksville, Missouri, which is a small farming community. Um, there was just there was all of these things sort of coming together that made me feel like I was out of place and I didn't know where I was going. And had I had I made a mistake by leaving the television business and going into PR and, you know, I had opened my own photography studio, I was doing my own advertising agency, and I was working at a car dealership, doing marketing and communication. So all these things. And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm like, what am I doing? What is this all about? Um, but, but my intention was, was to figure out why couldn't I satiate that desire to, um, to find success in the little things, right? I, I didn't care that, um, I wasn't a CEO of, of such of a top 500 company. I was just, I was always, there was always a drive or a hunger and ambition to do more and be more. Um, and I still have that, but now I can identify it, Courtney. I can say, that's not, that's, that's my ego trying to be number one, not, not coming from love or from my heart, from a, from a genuine place. So when I came to that realization, I, I, I like, just the armor came up down and I said, break me open. I don't care if I cry for a week or two or whatever I have to do or whatever I have to reveal, just help me be okay with me. Um, and that was, that was a great, that was a great experience. Well, it's interesting because I hear a lot in terms of what you're sharing as it relates to your journey. It really do speaks to courage, right? Yeah, so, right. you know, in terms of the courage of being able to look at yourself, the courage to be able to, you know, um, be open to being broken and, right. and the courage to be able to look at your different uh, uh, parts of your journey as it relates yeah. to work. What would you say to a listener right now who is saying, you know what? Hey, I've been there. I yeah. have, you know, I've, I am going through this journey even as right. we speak and I'm reevaluating some of the things that I've done yeah. How would you advise them in terms of kind of creating their own spiritual journey similar yeah. to yours? Well, first of all, it, it's 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 knowing that you're not alone through the process, and that's kind of how I felt. I was like, "Am I the only one going through this?" and and the reason I felt that was because I was very isolated. All of a sudden, I was isolating myself, and like I wasn't sharing stories or, or feelings with with my husband or or with friends. All of a sudden, I was just isolated. So when I became aware that I wasn't in this journey alone, that certainly helped. And and you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou is you know, 
courage is one of the most important virtues because without courage, you can't do anything consistently. You can you can do it here and there, but but the courage to speak honestly, to come from the heart and be vulnerable with your emotions, even even if you don't know how to deal with it, or even if even if you don't know why you're sad or why you're angry, but you have to get that out because there's healing in talking about it. So that's what I want listeners to hear and to know that they're not alone through that journey. And even though it's scary to, to talk about it or to, to come from the heart, it's okay. It really is okay. Cause the healing on the other side of those tears or that emotion or that fear it's, it's so worth it, Courtney. It's so worth it. It's interesting that you say that because as, as I'm sitting here, first off, I, I love the fact that um, I can see Hector because we're, we're, I, I leverage Zoom and I will say this, I, I love being able to see him because I love the value of sharing one story, being vulnerable Mm-hmm. And I and I look at Hector and I say, you know, because he and I are both, you know, trained journalists, broadcast mm-hmm. journalists. We've been on the other side of gathering information and telling one story, but it can be so different yeah. when we are sharing our story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and hearing you in terms of sharing your story, being vulnerable, sharing mm-hmm. your narrative. How 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 does that that feel because I can get a sense of everything that you shared in regards to what you just shared a moment ago in mm-hmm. regards to the other side of tears, mm-hmm. right? right? How does that feel, uh, especially being um, a journalist and now being able to empower people with your your story? And that was one of the the, the obstacles, the fear obstacles that I had to overcome. And, and that's why I, I had to leave television news because what I what I found happening to me in 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 the television news business was was seeing these veteran journalists smoking and drinking their lives away because they weren't dealing with their emotions, right? As a, as a journalist, we were, we were sent out, like I lived in a live truck, you know, and I was covering shootings and, and the, the worst mayhem possible. If it bleeds, it leads. And, and all of that, it, it doesn't go by the wade side. It, I, somehow, you know, I, I was internalizing that trauma for those people as I interviewed them. Um, you know, what I knew was when I could identify that, I'm like, that I that's that's not what I want for myself. And so uh, I made a very conscious decision when I was a, a reporter at in Kansas City that that uh, had a news director who would always ask me when I came in. He says, "Did you get a soundbite with the mother?" with the grieving mother. And I said, no, no one answered the door. But Courtney, I was lying because I did knock on the door because I, I knew I don't want it. I didn't want to participate in that. And so when, when I knew that I had to lie so that I didn't have to deal with the emotions, I knew something wasn't right here. So I, I knew that wasn't the right field for me. So I had to, to just sort of bow out gracefully and, and move into public relations. But, but that's what was important for me to to, to realize that as journalists, you know, when you're inundated with all the negativity of, of the stories that you're covering and that, that, that they are important to tell, but at some point um, there's, there wasn't an outlet. And I, I, I've been out of the television business for almost uh, 15 years as well. So I, I don't know if there's something there now to help reporters and, and journalists deal with the emotion of covering, you know, uh, such traumatic stories. But um, I, I was just happy that I somehow find the, found the courage to say, this is not for me. I don't know what is for me, but this, no. Yeah. Um, and and l- little by little, you know, I was writing, you know, I got into public relations and I was writing, you know, more stories about helping people, you know, taking um, taking stories that, you know, could could just be, you know, mundane, but finding a human human element that brought positivity to to whatever that topic was. And that was really helpful. Well, it's interesting you say that because 
um, my area focuses on positive psychology. And, uh, you know, I've been really busy during this period um, because uh, we now live in a time where so many different organizations are looking at mental health as relates to journalism and our journalists. So I have been a part of facilitating self-care sessions with journalists. I have been a part of well-being uh, sessions uh, with journalists, and it's been wonderful to see that organizations like the National Association of Black Journalists, NABJ, um, the Hispanic Journals Association, the Asian American Journals Association, um, looking at you know, levels of, of well-being, and also the Radio Television Digital News Association, RTDNA, um, has also been looking at uh, you know, how to serve, which, is, which has been wonderful for me right. to be able to share these resources um, with journalists to be able to help them in terms of uh, the coping aspect, because vicarious trauma is real, you yeah. know, and um, and and now it's it's uh, it's kind of being compounded mm -hmm. with social media. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. now it's not only the stories you're covering, no. but it's that whole 24 hour dynamic yeah. as it relates to social media. And so yeah. I'm so grateful that you're sharing your story because it helps so many other journalists and particularly those who are listening to the podcast to be able to understand, wow, I, you know, I'm not feeling alone in this. Right. That's one of right. the things that is so important is to know that you're not, not alone. Amen. Right. You know? And, and, and I wanted to briefly interject to the, the moral injury, right. The moral injury that I sort of suffered after, you know, you, you go to, you go to journalism school and you, you have these illusions that it's this moral and noble profession. And to a certain degree it is, but, but the longer I was in it, the more I realized that, that, telling these stories, these traumatic stories, not only had an effect on the people who experienced the trauma, but it had an effect on me telling the story. And, and I just didn't have the, the awareness, the psychological awareness, the emotional intelligence to deal with that. And so I struggled with, and, and even my mother, she's like, you went, you, you, you went all these years to college, you made all these sacrifices, and you're just going to leave it? just like that? I sure am. Yes, ma'am, I am. Because it is not good on my heart. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that's also important for listeners to know that, um, that even though you, you make sacrifices to get, you know, to, to journalism school and, and to be that best reporter, sometimes, um, hindsight is 2020 and it's it's your emotional health and your mental well-being is much more important than than um, than the sacrifices of going to four years for journalism school you know absolutely so it's it's, it's you know it's interesting one of my favorite authors outside of you Hector <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> happens to be Bronnie Ware. She's written a book called The Top Five Regrets. One uh -huh. of them, I talk about it often, one of her top five regrets. And, and so Bronnie, for those of you who may have not have heard me mention this uh, before, Bronnie Ware has written an incredible book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And she hmm. worked with people when they were going through their transition, right? In terms of yeah. hospice care. The number one regret she has is staying true to yourself. Hmm. And so when people were on their deathbed, one of their regrets were not staying true to themselves, mm -hmm. but living a life that they felt that other people expected of them opposed to the life that they wanted for themselves. Right. And so I love what you're sharing. And I love the fact that you're sharing your story because you are really standing in the truth of what is true to you. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that takes, that takes a lot of, of courage. And so I, I, I want to talk about Carlos for a second yes. in his journey, because this book, honestly, it speaks to me on so many different levels in terms of you in the, in, in the character of, of Carlos. Right. Although I felt like I, I slipped in terms of having a Freudian slip at the beginning of the show, mm -hmm. calling 
calling uh, Hector Carlos, right? <laughs> right, you know, right, um, right. And, and, and it's also because Hector and I are friends. I'm just way too comfortable <laughs> talking to Hector. Yeah. Um, but tell us, how did that story come about? Tell us, tell you, our audience a little it, bit about because that story part of and how it, it you came. know. Right, Courtney. So, so you know, even though it's a fictional story, it is somewhat based loosely on an incident that happened in my life. You know, um, I uh, grew up in Galveston, Texas, and um, you know, my mother uh, was a widow. Uh, my father died when I was two, two and a half years old, and my mother never remarried. So, so my mother was going through this emotional trauma that she she didn't know how to deal with. So. Before I knew it, I was, you know, going to school and um, I remember coming home from school that that first couple of days and um, I was on the porch, I was crying and I, I had been bullied at school and, and I didn't know why I was experiencing uh, this meanness towards me when I, I hadn't been mean to anyone. So it didn't make sense in my little, little brain. My mother comes out. And she's like, why are you crying? And I'm like, nobody, nobody at school likes me and, and they're being mean. And she says to me, it, it, because it's what, what she knew how, she says, stop crying, get your AWS inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So now yeah. as an adult, I can laugh about that, Courtney, because yeah. I know that emotionally she just wasn't available or didn't have the know-how, the tools to help my little brain process this trauma, this emotional trauma that I was experiencing. But because of that, Courtney, because of that situation and because she didn't validate the emotional trauma that I was going through, what my brain processed was, well, if my mom didn't care, I'm not going to tell anyone else because she doesn't care. So why would I tell my teachers that I'm being bullied or someone's being mean to me? So I internalized that and I just kept repressing it and repressing it and repressing it. And like little Carlos, me, Deshaun and Bridget were work, walking home from school one day and little Leon just kept at it. He kept at it. He kept at it. And I just exploded. I, I, all of a sudden, I had just had enough. So I turn around and put him in the DDT, the DDT, your old school, it's, it's a wrestling move that I would watch on TV. So I body slammed him onto the ground. And I started choking him and yelling, like, leave me alone. Please wow. just leave me alone. <laughs> I had never been a violent kid. Like I, I was the youngest of eight children, but I, I had never even fought with any of my siblings. Like all of this is new. And, and even my friends, Deshaun and Bridget at the time, they, they, you know, helped calm me down. And, and they were like, whoa, like what happened? I didn't know what happened. But, but what came from that was that one, yes, Leon left me alone. I wasn't bullied by him anymore. But, but the bigger story is that 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 moment taught me a bad behavior as, a, as an adult. It didn't allow me to, to have an open dialogue with other people about the emotional trauma, about the bullying. So guess what? Fast forward as an adult. I was doing the same thing, Courtney. All of a sudden, I, at work, I would let the you know my boss pile it on, pile it on. Go do this, go do that, and I'm because I'm a people pleaser, and because I wanted to do all these things, and I wanted to be so great, and I wanted to be liked, and I wanted to be loved. I all of this, I would take it all on, and then boom, like a two bottle, a two liter bottle of Coke, I would just explode, and and all of a sudden it was weird because people are like we've never seen this side of you. Like, whoa, you, you, mm, you've got a temper. No, I don't have a temper. I just wasn't taught. I didn't have the skills to say, I can't, I, I, I wasn't setting boundaries, right? I wasn't setting healthy boundaries and I wasn't having an open dialogue to say, hey, um, X, Y, and Z doesn't work for me. And it's really upsetting me and stressing me out. Um, instead, I would just bottle it, bottle it, bottle it, and then boom. But thanks to good old Carlos finding courage and being able to write that story, I have now had the self-awareness to know that if I feel something bubbling, it's because I haven't been honest and forthright in, in speaking my truth and having an emotional or an adult conversation. Because sometimes it's uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, the worst, I, I, 
that feeling of uncomfortableness is is much. I'd rather have that than to have this explosion and all of a sudden ruin, um, you know, a work relationship or or a personal relationship or a family relationship. So so that's what what Carlos, you know, has been able to teach me. Even though part of it is, you know, it is me. Um, the editor told me, um, we can't add all that violence in this children's book. We got to tone it down. So, you know, there, there, there's where the, you know, based on true events is, is at, but, but yeah, Carlos helped, has helped a lot in, in helping me identify those emotional triggers. You know, it was interesting that you say that because we have a past episode with, um, Dr. Katie Raher and Dr. Raher and uh, Dr. Courtney and I, <laughs> actually me, right, Dr. Courtney, I'm yeah. talking to myself in the third person, <laughs> but, you know, Dr. Katie and Dr. Courtney, one of the things that we, we stress is um, boundaries, and I love that you are talking about the value of boundaries, and I stress them as you know, uh, boundaries are our besties. Dr. Katie Raher talks about this as it relates to giving yourself that permission slip in terms of making sure you're also protecting yourself. And I love right. what you're doing and in, in terms of talking about that evolution in terms of growth. And I have to say that one of the things that I love so much about your book was and is the, the fact that you focus in on the relationships that you just mentioned yeah. with Deshaun and Bridget. Mm -hmm. And part of positive psychology is looking at positive. I, well, I like to qualify, not yes. simply relationships, but positive relationships. How have positive relationships serve you in terms of being able to kind of step into your courage. Mm -hmm. And then you also talked about, which I really love is ability in terms of sharing, getting the shame out right. is, is right. really helps in terms of sharing. Well, that, I, I love that question because that's what the, the, for me, that has been sort of the biggest lesson in writing this book was to see that I can have such positive relationships in my life because that it allows me to be genuine. It, it allows me to have an open dialogue with whoever, right? It could be at work or it could be in my personal life or it could be in family life. It allows me to, to be open and to say, hey, these situations um, aren't working and what, what can we do so that we can all have a better experience um, in, in, especially at work? Because for me, the work family becomes secondary um, com to, compared to, to, you know, your personal life. But, um, you know, positive relationships, it has changed. Um, I, I realize the importance of having them in my life. And so now I, I seek to have that. I, ha I seek to have an open relationship with my coworkers, with my friends, to have an open dialogue, to say, hey, are we on the same page here? Are we, are we, are we clicking? Are we vibing? You know, has anything upset you? Are you having your needs met by me? Is this friendship moving us forward? Um, and I think those, those are sometimes uncomfortable conversations, but um, nonetheless, they, they feed our soul and they feed that relationship to, um, so that it's not just a superficial relationship, so that, that you feel a, a real deep connection to this human experience that we're having. I love that you said this feeds your soul right? oh, in terms mm -hmm. of that. So important. Yeah, I, I, I'm curious in regards to because right now I, I literally have picked up Hector's book and I, I love one of the things is when I shared it on social media, I got um, some comments and private message. Oh, my God, they're so adorable. <laughs> the, the, the characters are so cute. It's so well done. Yeah. Talk to us as it relates to the value in terms of what you hope when a person picks up your book. What do you hope in terms of, um, you know, maybe that parent, maybe yes. that child? maybe that teacher, because I love the right. teacher in your, in your book as well. So what do you hope that they will really be inspired or understand or transformed in terms of what they read when they pick up your book? You know, Courtney, I want, I wanted this book um, to, to have sort of, uh, it, yes, it's written for children, but I also knew that, that parents 
would be the ones reading it to their children or helping their children read. And I certainly have uh, had a lot of teacher friends reach out to me um, that that say, what a great book. And it's it helps them bridge that conversation with with their students or their children about about being bullied. And my my hope and my desire was that that that's the conversation that we could have that that, yes, although at home, um, with siblings, you know, maybe your siblings are mean or they pick on you, but it's, it's when it's happening at school in an environment where it's, it's not, it's not tolerable and it's not acceptable that, that um, you, that teachers and children have um, the ability, the know-how to, to identify that, right? To say, okay, um, I saw little Carlos, he's, he's not been wanting to go to recess and he's a happy go lucky kid. And now he doesn't want to go. What kind of conversations can you have with that child to begin to um, maybe help them open up? Because if you ask them straight, are you being bullied? They're going to say no, but there's a psychology. And I've talked to some therapists about, uh, as I was writing this book, um, you know, some of the signs that, that parents could look for or teachers could look for in identifying the the signs of, of bullying, because I'm a prime example that if it's not addressed, that it can have um, detrimental, de detrimental effects on your life as an adult. Um, and I have been lucky enough to have the self-awareness to have a good group of, of friends um, that that how that allow me to ask those questions not only of myself but of them sometimes is just to say hey why am i why am i acting this way or why am i reacting this way so if nothing else it bridges that conversation for parents um and and children alike to be able to say hey um something's going on i don't know how to express it but i think with a little bit of of, with the little tools in your sort of toolkit, you can have that open dialogue. Well, you know, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to wrap up our interview in a moment. And um, unfortunately, because I don't even want to do I know. it. <laughs> um, I know. I don't. That's just me trying to remind myself to remain yeah. on task because I'm way too excited talking to Hector. Hector, if there's a listener out there right now that's listening and it's, and they're saying to themselves, you know, I want to have the courage, you know, like Carlos in terms of facing, you know, either whatever adversity that may be. Right. But I also want to have the courage of telling my story, too. Mm -hmm. And what would you share with them for someone who's listening right now, who's thinking about, you know what, I think I have a book in me as yes. well. Yes. I have a story to tell. Yes. What yes. would you share with them in terms of really inspiring and transforming mm -hmm. them to say, go for it. Do it. It's, it's, it's positive self-talk, Courtney, positive self-talk. I could, I, 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 there were so many times that I was talking myself out of not only writing the book, but even publishing it. Once it was all done, I thought to myself, well, it's, it's okay, but you know, the second one or the third one will be better. I'll just put, leave this one in, you know, the files. And it, and it was, it was like, no, I've done the work. I'm going to publish it. And, and I know, and just being aware that that little nagging voice that tells you it's, oh, no one's going to read that story. Nobody cares about that story. Really, it's no, no one's going to care about it. Acknowledging that that, that, that voice is there, but it, it's not the only voice. The other voice, the self-talk, the, the self-positive talk was, okay, yes, that that's a, that's a possibility, but the other possibility is that someone will read it and it will change their life. And if it does, then so be it. So that was the voice I allowed to win the argument in my head. And so if I could tell listeners that that that, that was the key for me, the positive self-talk is to say, you, you know, the negative things aren't going to go away, you know, and you can't beat them away, but it's just to accept them or to acknowledge them to say, okay, yes, that's possible. But what if a hundred people read it and it, it makes a big impact. So that, that for me is the, the biggest takeaway. I love that. Listen to that positive voice. Yes. Right? I love yes. that. So we're going to actually 
have a link on drcourtneyalston.com. So you will find a link on drcourtneyalston.com uh, that will allow you to grab many copies, by the way, yes. of Carlos uh, Finds Courage. But uh, Hector, tell our listeners where they can find you so they can remain connected with you as well. Yes. Well, there is a couple of ways. Um, the book, you can find it through amazon.com, Carlos Finds Courage. Um, I've got a couple of websites. Carlos Finds Courage is the website that houses some of the information for the book um, and also gives you some background on, on how I came to that story. But the other part is um, it's, it's called, um, what is my I can't seem to find it. There is a there's a, a media company that I'm working with, um, and it is called WonderWorldMedia.com. And what my hope is that um, that this story can generate enough excitement that I can turn it into an animation, a short animation film that then we can show in um, in some film festivals. And so that that's the exciting part is to see that that not only is this story resonating with parents and, and, and children, but that, that this is just the tip of the iceberg, girl. I got so <laughs> many more to go. <laughs> well, I am so excited that they can find you there. And, and guys, actually, we have a, a, a link of ours for Amazon that you will be able to find it on our website. So you can yes. grab uh, uh, Hector's book. I'm about to call you Carlos again. Where, where <laughs> I it's know. coming from. <laughs> um, but, you know, I always end the show with this question because, you know, uh, you know, as I went through the journey of creating this, you know, podcast um, and then also the work that I've had in terms of, you know, as, you know, Dr. Courtney, in terms of of really valuing um, positive psychology. Mm -hmm. And it's been about making sure people are committing to their happiness and committing to well being. And I always love to ask every guest, you know, how are they committing to their happiness or their well being? So I wanna ask you, Hector, how are you yes. committing? Yes, for me, the biggest commitment for that happiness is healthy boundaries and knowing that that I'm truly happy when I go for a walk in nature. Nothing revives me and rejuvenates me like a walk in nature and, and meditation. I mean, those, those things are staples and, and those are my commitments, not only to myself, but it's to the, the people in my life. Because I know if, if I take the time to be happy with myself, then it's just going to spill over into everyone else that's in my life. I love that. If yeah. you create, if you create happiness within yourself, it yes. creates that ripple effect. And as a person yes. who has known you, I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> like it's over 20 years. Yes. Right. Yes. That is so true of you. Yes. You have an incredible light. I'm so grateful that you are shining it with me and everyone around the world. You are spectacular. Thank you so much for being here today. I love you so much, Courtney. Let's continue this conversation online. Email us at podcast at drcourtneyalston.com. That's podcast at D-R-K-O-R-T-N-I-A-L-S-T-O-N dot com. Join us on Instagram at Courting Happiness. Don't forget that's courting with a K. Also, I hope you join our private Facebook community. You can find us at Courting Happiness podcast community. Our private Facebook group is a safe haven to share, meet more people looking to build positive relationships, focus on well-being and create a happier life. Now, are you ready to spread happiness? We hope you subscribe and share this podcast with your family, friends, co-workers, and all the important people in your world. We release a new episode every Thursday. Congratulations on your continued commitment to your courting happiness journey. Thank you so much for listening. We want you to be well, be happier, and be kinder to yourself. We can't wait to see you next week.